what, what's cool about YouTube is you can advertise on, on pretty much anybody's channel or videos. So your ads are coming up on your competitors' videos, which is a fun little, you know, jab in the ribs if you <laughs> want to play that game. In November of last year, Google said that it would start placing ads on videos and channels that don't have monetization enabled. Here's what's interesting. It's been almost a year. Have you seen the ability to push ads onto channels and videos that don't look to have monetization enabled? No, I, ha I actually haven't seen that. Right, there's a ton of limitation, which is surprising to me given that a year ago, YouTube was like, oh, we're opening up the floodgates, ads go everywhere. And still, when I when I you know find a channel or a video that I really want to advertise on, I will see very often that, oh, this for whatever reason isn't accessible or available. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and this is episode 320. And this is the show where we share you cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales for your business through paid traffic, as well as how to convert those leads into actual customers. I am joined alongside my awesome co-host, Qasem Aslam. How the heck are you, buddy? Ralph, I'm living the dream. How was your vacation? My vacation was, uh, I got the worst head cold I've ever had in my entire life for like the first three or four days, which really sucked. And I thought I had COVID. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> Good timing. Uh, who I'm really excited to have on this week's show, none other than Will the Irish Breeze Palmer, coming all the way from Waterford, Ireland. Uh, he's about to get married in a month. So, you know, he's trying to get in all the good times before, you know, he, he makes the wedding vows. One of those, which is here on traffic, you know, obviously talking about traffic here and perpetual traffic coming on the show. But Will is one of the guys at tier 11 who I've wanted to get on perpetual traffic for quite some time, although he's been very uh, challenging to schedule because he's got so many secrets. He just wanted to create more and more secrets and more high quality content <laughs> and keep them from you, the perpetual traffic listener, and just drop them all here today because uh, Will runs our YouTube division at Tier 11. And he's got like a really interesting perspective on what makes YouTube successful for businesses because he comes from a Facebook ads background. He was a media buyer for Agora and then came over, was recruited heavily by uh, Tier 11, finally got him on, on staff here. And he's run upwards of $10 million in Facebook ads. So that's a lot of knowledge. And then he's bringing that over to another platform, which we have talked about here in Perpetual Traffic, which is similar, but not quite the same in YouTube. And that's what Will is going to be talking about today. So if you're new on YouTube or you've been running ads on YouTube for quite some time, uh, really excited to hear what Will has to say here about some of the customers at Tier 11 that have had success on YouTube and what are the common characteristics. So welcome to Perpetual Traffic, Will the Irish Breeze Palmer. Thank you very much, Ralph. I'm super excited to be here and yeah, quite the intro there. So thanks very much. Well, it's nothing about, uh, you know, we just pump everybody up as much as possible. People are probably wondering why the Irish breeze. Well, first off, you're Irish, but the guy that you've learned a lot of your YouTube tips and tricks from is our good friend and fellow compadre over the, in the UK, uh, Tom Breeze. So hence the Irish breeze. Somebody wanted to call you Irish spring, but that doesn't really make Irish a breeze sounds sense. like a bottle of cologne. Um, sounds like a scent. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's really kinda, nice yeah. soap. The Irish breeze. I like it. I like it. I hope it, I hope it sticks. It's definitely starting to stick around the agency anyway. So that's good. <laughs> I might have to so, set up a, a new Twitter account. <laughs> I think you will. New Twitter, Irish breeze. Like you should grab that like yeah. right now before somebody listens yeah. to the show. <laughs> will, maybe you can give us a little bit of a background. We did discuss this in uh, a number of episodes recently, especially within the last month or so talking about how YouTube is the new Facebook for a lot of f frustrated Facebook advertisers. But you obviously come from a Facebook background, you know, upwards of $10 million uh, in spend. Like that's a lot of experience. Like I know the accounts that you were on and still continue to be on inside tier 11 for your Facebook side. Like why should somebody consider YouTube, especially if they're a Facebook only advertiser? And I think you're like a great example of this exact type of person maybe you're as a as a perpetual traffic listener out there this is your situation i've been on facebook for a long time why should i switch over to youtube and and like what are the big reasons as to why and, and maybe some tips and tricks we can talk about here as to how to make it successful yeah so 
Ralph, I think one of the biggest reasons why somebody should should look at YouTube if if they're on, if they're primarily on Facebook is diversity. So it, everybody has to diversify their traffic. You don't want to be over reliant on one channel. So we've seen that more recently with Facebook. A lot of a lot of people have been over reliant on Facebook, and then all of the iOS changes that have come into place has, has hit people really hard. Um, and I know we've seen a big influx of people now who are looking to to kind of try different channels. They're looking to maybe try TikTok or they're looking to try uh, YouTube. And yeah, that's kind of where I've, the, the position I've come from now is a lot of the clients that I've been having success with on YouTube, they are primarily Facebook advertisers or businesses who have advertised on Facebook. And now they're looking to diversify. So we can take those assets, their best performing assets on Facebook, considering they're within certain limitations and are suited to youtube we can then take those assets and try them on youtube um so yeah it, it, it can be a real seamless uh transition from facebook to youtube and then working together it's it's just it's another it's another aspect to have in the marketing mix and you know if you're having success on youtube it's definitely going to uplift um your your facebook ads or, or your google search ads or wherever else you're you're advertising um and again, it just has it has another element to it, whereas it's obviously it's primarily or it's solely video. So by mm-hmm. by giving people that video first, they're they're you're um you're able to get people's brand awareness out there a lot more and you can you can introduce people to your business in a whole new channel that that they've never been before, rather than only Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think um you had mentioned that the majority of YouTube traffic is, well, I wouldn't say majority. It's like there's a split in YouTube traffic yeah. based upon the audiences. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more like, cause YouTube is a wholly different animal. Like we say, okay, take your best performing asset and then try it on Facebook like that in a general sense is a general strategy place to start is a good place to start. However, Facebook is truly an interruption marketing vehicle. So as a result of that, people are in a different place in the buying cycle when they see your ad in the newsfeed or on Instagram or whatever it happens to be. We even have coined a term for the YouTube side of our business as interrupted intent, which is there's some interruption, but there is a little bit of intent there, but then not all the traffic on YouTube is even traffic that you necessarily are going to have success with. Maybe you can break that down as sort of how you see it from a high level. Yes. Yeah, so even on YouTube, not all traffic is going to be created equally. So the way the way we kind of look at it is these are approximate uh, figures or estimate, estimate, estimates. Um, but 50% of people come to YouTube for inspiration and the other 50% of people come for information. And it's that 50% of people who are coming to YouTube for information, they are the people that we want to target. So we can kind of look at YouTube as a game of moments. And people who come for information are, are coming from kind of are coming for three key moments. So those moments are they want to know something or they want to do something or they want to or they want to buy something. So I kind of I have an example that I can use of myself. So more just recently, I've been I've been getting into running, and I've kind of done a little bit too much too soon. So I, I developed chin splints. I never had chin splints before, so I didn't know what they were. So my first protocol was I, I went to YouTube and I was searching like what are YouTube or what are chin splints. I wanted to know about them. And then the next thing was okay, what can I do about this? So I was like, how do I improve shin splints uh, techniques to build up my muscles in my lower leg? And then I started looking for products. So I found there was these shin splint or uh, shin sleeves that you could buy and different splints that you could use for shin splints. So then I was I was researching the best uh, the best lower leg sleeves to use for shin splints. So that was kind of how I moved through each of those stages of information. And because I had such a strong, uh, such a strong problem and such a strong intent, I would basically soak up any kind of information that I could get about shin splints. So it didn't matter if it came from an ad or if it came from 
the type of video that I was looking for. If somebody showed me a really cool video like, oh, hey, you have shin splints. Look at this amazing product. I, I, would, be, I would be automatically you know, clicking, looking for that. I would be checking out their website, checking the price, seeing what the offer is like. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of a, an example of how YouTube has a higher intent than Facebook. But the key to that then, it has a higher intent, but you're at, you also have to have a higher level of relevancy then in order to get people to click away and, and in order for your ad to be relevant to that customer. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So the, the breakdown, like without really knowing, I mean, depending on what statistic that you're looking at, I mean, I think YouTube is, a lot of people think of it as, as an entertainment channel to a certain degree. And that's sort of the inspiration portion of what you're talking about. But then there's this other very large chunk, whether it's 50-50 or whatever the estimates happen to be, is they're really looking for specific information on how to do something or at least in a discovery phase. But there might be sort of a, a much better level, like in your case, you're going from know about, do something and then buy. It could be slipping all the way just to buy too, or maybe the do about, like it depends on where that is in the continuum, sort of the Eugene Schwartz awareness curve. It's like, where are you in that spot? And I think the, the shin splints example is a great one, but there's also like, there's higher intent with a lot of cases. Like for me, the way that I use YouTube is I'll say, all right, um, how to play the master of puppets solo, like verse three or whatever it happens to be like this really intricate part. Like I know what I'm looking for. And then every single time I do that, there's always like this, it's probably like a Tom breeze guitar ad. That's a pre-roll because <laughs> they're really, yes. really good. I know which ones they are because I've clicked <laughs> on them before. So it's like, but there is a, is a continuum of intent on YouTube at the very least. If you sort of think about it in these three phases, you can, create content and ads that are capturing all sort of three phases of those audiences that are looking for information. Is there any value at all to going after the pure inspiration or entertainment audiences? Or is that just something that we sort of set aside at least initially? What's your sense on that? And how do you think about that? Yes. Yeah, so my sense on that is you will automatically go after those type of people if you're using certain types of targeting. So for example, if we're doing keyword targeting, so let's say I'm targeting uh, a keyword, uh, how to improve shin splints. We'll stick with the shin splint example. So how to improve shin splints. So if I'm targeting that keyword, my ad is going to show up in front of any video that somebody who has typed in that keyword within the last session. So a session is 40 minutes. So anybody who has typed in how to improve shin splints, either on the Google search uh, results, the regular Google, Google search results, or else within YouTube, if they've typed that in within the last 40 minutes, and then they're watching a Justin Bieber or a Rihanna video or something completely unrelated to that, they're, they're now at YouTube for that inspiration or entertainment purpose your ad will show up there because because of the time frame and because they've typed that in, in, in within that session frame um, so it's a little bit different than we where i like to start with youtube then is placement targeting so i could also take that keyword how to improve shin splints and i use a tool called adzula so check them out they're they're a really good tool if you're doing any youtube advertising type your specific keyword into Adzula. That will give you the 50 results that will come up uh, within YouTube for that. So it, it replicates the search results for YouTube. And then you, you will get the exact videos that come up for that, search, for that search term or for that keyword. And then you can go, okay, copy and paste those 50 placements, plug them into your campaign, your placement campaign, and then your ad will only show in front of those videos. So that has higher intent than the keyword targeting, if you know, if that makes sense. Um, so you can definitely kind of, you, you can look at it, you can get more granular with your intent and with your interruption. Um, there's gonna be a lot more scale with when you're doing keyword targeting or topic targeting or audience targeting. So you'll hit a much lar larger audience, but it can take, it can take a lot longer in order for the, the algorithm to get dialed in and to find that customer in, in order for you to get the, the CPA or return on ad spend that, you, that you're happy with. 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Now, I know there's there might be a little bit of a difference of opinion here because I think we've talked about this in the past of, uh, and it depends on what your budget is and depends on what your intent is and it depends on who you've really been taught by as far as like who your YouTube mentor may or may not be. But there's pros and cons to going broad as well as going narrow. And I think Kasim is in the, uh, you know, is in the camp where going broad is the best way to at least start out. But Will, you're saying kind of going a little bit more on the narrow side and maybe explaining that, maybe we can talk about like the differences between the two and what might be best for your business, the PT listener. Yeah, the, the reason I go on the narrow side is because I start with the placement. It's the most narrow you can go basically. And then I will, I will build my keywords around those three moments. So people who want to know, people who want to do, and people who want to buy. And then I will create different ad groups for each of those kind of key moments. And then from there, I can, okay, this placement is starting to cost too much. We're not getting any conversions. I can turn that placement off. So I can optimize very fast. And the reason why I do that is because a lot of our clients are coming from Facebook over to YouTube. So I'm kind of trying to prove YouTube for them. And I want to, I want to show them the, the best, I want to put the best foot forward basically for YouTube. And, and once I can get that working at some level, and then we need to scale to the next level, that's when we can, you know, it's much easier to get budget approval then to move on. But uh, mm. yeah, I always see the best results from placements, but it's just, there's a limit to how much you're able to scale it. Yeah, and whenever we have a, a new customer that's coming from the Facebook side, going over to YouTube or any other platform, there's this, is it going to work trial period that we, we grant them sort of in the first you know two to four weeks, they pay a slightly lower fee just to sort of see how things are going. And the, but it's, it's really, it's about a proving out the model, at least initially getting some success, not getting success to trick them into thinking that this is something that's going to work, but will the platform actually work with on the intent side, far more intent as opposed to interrupted intent side, and then branching out from there, looking at your data, understanding how can you go far more broad, uh, which makes a whole lot of sense, especially coming from a performance side of the equation, which is what we are as an agency. But also Tom Breeze, like his agency is all performance based. So it's really, it's all about getting results right out of the gate and then building on that. Um, and maybe we can bridge into like how you go from super intent based. How do you make that transition? All right, I've got all these placements, 50 placements for, you know, this one keyword that I've plugged into at Zula. But then after that, like now you have those audiences, you tried that out, you got some conversions. How do you make that next leap into going broad? Maybe, you know, you and Kasim can kind of talk about like the broad audience just in general, how you really do make that work like what what's your sense there is like what that next step would be once you sort of you know run through your initial intent based uh, placements do you, you want me to go first castle or do you want to go yeah i think you're on a roll will i don't want to yeah, break I would, it i would right, go cool. there we can hit the break yeah. just meant that like if you can talk about like how you transition from intent to more broad and then Kasim can come in and talk about broad and then like you know a different strategy like you guys are coming from it from two different angles which is i think super important so anyway go ahead mm -hmm. yeah so i always kind of look i always approach it from a kind of a three-pronged approach so phase one is testing the audience i find the audience phase two then is is testing the creatives and phase three is scaling so going back to that first phase and how i kind of move from more intent to uh, more interruption or going for the broader audiences. So I will start with, as I, as I mentioned, I will start with the placement targeting. That's where I can get the best results. From there, then we look at, okay, what are our best placements? Where have we been getting the, con the most conversions over the last 30 days? Actually watch those and videos. And when you say okay. placements, just so we're clear, like placements yep. mean different things on different platforms. Just explain for the audience what yep. placements are. Yeah, so placements are only going to be youtube videos so it's either going to be youtube videos or youtube channels so right now i'm i'm actually talking about the individual youtube videos so what videos 
have been driving the most success for us because that's that's the, the first targeting that I will always start with, just placements of videos rather than even channels. And okay, wh- what is it about this video? Why is that video converting? Like what, you know, what's the connection between this video and our landing page or this video and our offer? So yeah, I actually watch all of those videos, see what kind of ideas you can get from those videos. You know, you might get some ideas for different uh, interests you can target or different keywords. Um, I will also always take the the headings of the videos that have been driving the most conversions and using those in a keyword campaign. So let's say, you know, I've, I have one placement within uh, my placement campaign that's brought in 20 conversions over the last week. Okay, this is this is a really good placement. So then I take the headline from that, plug it in to a new campaign, keyword campaign with just one keyword targeting that that heading for that and that, that often works really well and it's just a really quick and easy way to scale up um, and then from there I will kind of look at you can look in your audience insights look at people who who have been converting over the last week or the last 30 days and then you can actually look at your audience insights and see the different types of affinity audiences or different um, in-market audience audiences that are coming from those Another good one is custom intent. So again, I will take all of the keywords that have been working well or all of the placements that have been working well, and you can actually create custom intent audiences based on keywords or based on uh, websites as well. So often the placements that you're targeting, they will be related to a business or some kind of an influencer or somebody like that who will often have a website which can can be really relevant to... um, to your audience in order for you to build a custom intent. So for me, it all stems from that super targeted placement campaign at the start. And then I kind of extrapolate all of the data from there in order to scale out. Um, and kind Can of, I ask you a question about, yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, the, the placement specifically, um, what, what's cool about YouTube is you can advertise on, on pretty much anybody's channel or videos. So your ads are coming up on your competitors' videos, which is a fun little, you know, jab in the ribs if you <laughs> want to play that game. Uh, in November of last year, Google said that it would start placing ads on videos and channels that don't have monetization enabled. And for our listeners, if you didn't know this already, uh, a, a video uh, channel had to have Google monetization enabled, meaning they're basically opting in to have advertisements placed on their videos in order for ads to run. And in November, Google goes, you know what? We have the right to monetize all the content on our platform. We're going to put ads on everything. Here's what's interesting. It's been almost a year. I haven't seen that. And I'm curious, Will, if you have. Have you have you seen the ability to push ads onto channels and videos that don't look to have monetization enabled? No, I, ha- I actually haven't seen that. Um Right. There's a ton of limitation, which is surprising to me, given that a year ago, YouTube was like, oh, we're opening up the floodgates, ads go everywhere. And still, when I when I you know find a channel or a video that I really want to advertise on, I will see very often that, oh, this for whatever reason isn't accessible or available. So I was just curious as to whether or not you're seeing that too. Mm, yeah, no. I, and I actually haven't even come up against it too much where they say that I can't advertise on certain videos or, or channel placements. A lot of the placements that I'm targeting have the optimization or monetization already open. Mm, that's helpful. Have you found that to be a limiting factor for you to be able to scale Gossam? Like you've got lots of channels that you're just like, ah, you know, they'd be great if I could get on them, but I can't for whatever reason. It's actually not for scale. It's, it's going the other direction. It's more of a sniper approach. So I'll have um, ultra niche products, offerings, et cetera. And we run really aggressive competitor campaigns. I come from Google search and in Google search, competitor campaigns are gold mines and they're gold mines that are oft overlooked. Um, and so what I like to do is I like to go out there and say, okay, who are your competitors? Uh, who are, you know, potential strategic partners? Um, one lateral, you know, lateral move aside, et cetera. And then we build this whole profile and I want ads on every single one of those channels and videos. Um, because, you know, I mean, y'all have been talking about, um, how YouTube is more intent based, which I think is is a really, it's a really brilliant delineation between Facebook, and it's not one that I really thought of before this call. I never really thought about saying that YouTube was more intent based than Facebook, but I agree with you. And given that it's more intent based than Facebook, I think that the traffic your competitor videos are getting, 
you just need ads on all of those things. And the 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 cost per views are so freaking cheap. Like if you're listening to this podcast right now and you have, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a competitor. It just needs to be somebody who's speaking to the same buyer that you want to speak to. Go run ads just on their channel and you'll find out that you pay a very little amount of money and the results tend to be, I think, like staggering because of how qualified that traffic is. And, and forgive that tangent. Ralph started asking about placements and that popped into my head. Mm, yeah yeah that, i mean that could that, be, go ahead yeah no sorry I, that could be a really good kind of first campaign for somebody to do Kasim. what you mentioned there so you find these youtube channels within your industry almost every industry will have a lot of big channels on youtube just pick four or five of those target those channels specifically with a small budget and then from there you can almost work backwards then so base see what videos are getting the most traction within those channels and then you could target those videos specifically now again you're not going to get a huge you're not going to get a huge amount of scale from this again it's going to be like laser focus or laser targeted but you know you'll get some good cpas from them because they will be so relevant to uh to your niche yeah for sure i mean you were talking about sort of the 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 stepwise approach i just want to make sure we give this this uh you know argument so to speak enough credence because i think it's fascinating the way that it's done you could go in your case you're going um you know keyword search tool find specific specific placements meaning videos in this case might be channels but in most cases specific videos gain some momentum look at that data inside your your analytics inside google and then start to formulate a plan from there. One of the other parts to that initial foray of going keyword search tool, finding placements could be find your biggest competitor and put your, you know, put your ads in front of their audience because could be another way to sort of do that sort of that, that laser focus that, you know, that sniper style to start, but then you take the sniper learnings and then you start to layer on other potential audiences after you look at your data and you really see, once again, this is looking at the data, everybody. And this is something that we always talk about. It's like, all right, even if you don't get a whole lot of conversions and chances are an intent-based, um, you know, using specific placements that are highly targeted to intent-based search keywords, potentially you're going to get conversions, which is always good. So you can find that out, but sometimes you don't. But the point is, is that you now have data, which you can analyze and you can look at affinity, which I like to talk about a little bit more in market audiences and then custom intent. And then that's really how you gain even more data. We haven't even started testing the actual video asset at this point. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is strictly targeting. That's all we've talked about so far. Strictly targeting. And we're really <laughs> taking, in this case, probably what you know, the best Facebook performing ad we we think that's probably mostly interruption based, not interrupted intent based which is more youtube but we're using that one asset in this case are we using multiple assets like what's your sense like sort of at this stage of your discovery like one or two assets couple like one like how much do people really need to get to this stage yeah like if they have one asset and it and it works then we we could do one asset but ideally you want to have more than one just so you can test so like two to four assets ideally is what i like to see and then the first kind of benchmark that I'm looking for with those assets is a minimum of a 1% click-through rate. So I haven't really seen anything work that has a click-through rate less than 1%. So that's kind of the big thing that you need to get your ads to is, is a 1% click-through rate. Now, in your experience, like a good performing Facebook ad that is like, let's say it's the unicorn ad over on the Facebook side. Is that what's been your experience? Are those is it hit or miss? Like, what's your set? Can you get to that benchmark relatively easily in your first foray into YouTube, or what? What's your sense? Yeah, no, you definitely the can. Yeah, you definitely can as long as it it meets a, some of the criteria that it needs for YouTube. So it needs to be of a certain level of production. So I've I've definitely seen the higher production levels work a lot better than say just somebody holding up a video uh, <laughs> a camera an iphone and and filming Selfie, themselves so yeah. it has 
yeah, like a selfie style, which, which works really well on, which does work really well on Facebook because that's more native to Facebook. But people just kind of expect that higher production level when they sit down to watch YouTube. It's, it's closer to a video or a television advertisement than it is a Facebook video ad. Um, and the other thing is the ones that work best is somebody like it has to be the spokesperson for the business talking or not necessarily the spokesperson, but people usually like a story style rather than just kind of a a lot of times on Facebook, you can see those kind of B rolls working really well with like GIFs or different uh, animations coming over them. It's not, it's more so it's almost like a, yeah, like a moving um, image that, that goes into something else. So the YouTube video really has to be, uh, like a traditional video ad in the sense. No, I like the way that you said story style. YouTube has a, a tool called sequences. Have you played with sequences at all? Yeah, I have actually in the past. So that's when, when they have to watch a certain percentage of one video ad in order to watch the next one. So it's like a remarketing tool. Yep. Yeah, they have to watch a video from Pillar A before they can move to Pillar B. I love that, man. I mean, the, because now you're you're basically forcing a story. Like they have to be engaged with content in each segment before they can move along which that's unique to youtube i don't i don't i don't i'm not seeing another advertising network that lets you do that yeah it's i've i've done it on facebook as well but you you just have to build your remarketing audiences so you have like your one kind of pillar piece of content and then we used to pull nuggets out of that so let's say we pull seven or eight oh, sure, nuggets smart. from that and then okay this is nugget one and then anybody who's watched 50 percent of that we'll show them nugget two, 50%. And then anybody who's watched 50% of that, then you can give them the pillar piece of content or the video sales letter. So yeah, that's that's a tactic that I have seen work well on Facebook and YouTube actually. Yeah. Uh, Ralph, can I champion broad broad targeting? Yeah, let's, let's go at it. Because it's like, we're going, like this is a different strategy than what we talked about uh, three or four weeks ago when we talked about YouTube versus Facebook. So Kasim, obviously you guys go a little bit more on the broad side, gather data, very different approach here. Maybe you can describe that a little bit, compare and contrast. Yeah, well, I'll say first, the big caveat, it depends on the customer and the offer, obviously. And Will said something that I really respect. He said, look, I'm taking a bunch of Facebook advertisers over to YouTube. And so I have to be able to show them results, which makes perfect sense to me. So with the strategy that I'm offering, I think the the first caveat I'll offer to our listeners is you're you're throwing a bunch of spaghetti against the wall um, and and letting YouTube determine what works. And Google Ads has something that we call broad automation, where you use broad match plus smart bidding. And I'm bringing this up because I think it's it's maybe a, kind of an ac- academic foundation. But if you've ever run Google Ads before, Google actually encourages people now to use broad match key phrases, which in the past was absolutely freaking ridiculous because Google's so expansive with its match type. So if you search for you know um, family law, uh, and Google's going broad match, they'll give you something that's so analogous, it'll be like, oh, you know, puppy attorney or whatever. And then you just get something that has nothing to do with whatever it is that you're searching. Recently, and I mean the last 12 months, Google's ability to use broad match with smart bidding has proven to be very effective when it works. And when it doesn't, it fails quickly. And so it's it's a solid tool for us inside of search. We brought that paradigm over to YouTube. So we, and it, it's really, I think, most applicable for offerings that are a little broader. You know, I mean, like a CPA, for instance, would be a great example. Everybody knows what a CPA is. You know, if you need a CPA, it doesn't take a lot of explaining, right? So like, um, you'll see a lot of companies that do this now, like monday.com. It's a software company. It's for businesses, kind of a broader offering. It's, you know, right down the center of the lane in terms of what it is that they're, that they're recommending. Um, so I wouldn't recommend this for, you know, if you just invented the, the latest, greatest widget, but I, I have to know how it works. I don't think that this, this is the, the method or the approach. All of those disclaimers aside, sorry for <laughs> building this weird little fortress of, of uh, words around what it is that I'm trying to say. We took all targeting away, which is insane. It's insane. And if you tell a client, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running ads with zero targeting outside of obviously the geographic targeting. Like it's kind of like saying, oh, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> Right. As a paid advertiser, you look at that and it's like, hey, Mr. Client, thank you so much for all the money that you gave me. I'm not going to do my job. I'm just going to batch and blast these assets that you gave me out into the ether of the world and then pray to the gods of the Internet that it yields something. Here's what's nuts is it worked. 
we, we, and this was for a company, they sell a specialized type of education, teaching business owners how to do something. And I, that's as much as I can say, cause I have to veil their identity and anything more would give them away. Um, so they spend a significant amount of money, but what's funny is, uh, f- first we didn't have the ramp up period we normally have in YouTube. We didn't have the learning period we normally have in YouTube. And you know, the first couple of days were scary, right? Cause they needed a $25 cost per lead. And we were like at $400 cost per leads. But once YouTube figured out who opted in, once YouTube's like, oh, I get this. Will bought, Ralph bought. Let's go figure out who looks like Will and Ralph. Then all of a sudden, we were just like, I mean, just pouring gas on a fire. And what's cool about it, where the ultra segmented campaigns can definitely perform, Will made a comment earlier that I agree with, they limit your ability to scale. You're just always hitting the ceiling. And it's like, all right, I have to go find a new segment, go find a new audience. With this, this broad match plus smart bidding, and that's the caveat, by the way, is you have to use smart bid strategies, which you really don't have much of an alternative any longer anyway. So I guess maybe I shouldn't have even said that. Um, broad match plus smart bidding, it, it, it puts the responsibility onto YouTube. We use target CPA ultimately. We start with maximized conversion just to, to get enough juice to feed the algo. And then we switch to target CPA, which means you get to tell Google, hey, Google, I want target CPA is target cost per acquisition. I want leads under this threshold. And now Google is going to try to go get you those leads under the threshold. And as long as you're being reasonable about those numbers, uh, our experience is that it works. You have to have an adequate spend. So if you're mom, pa, kettle, and you're running your YouTube channel at a thousand bucks a month, don't do this. But, you know, if you're a business that, that has a budget, um, you know, I'd say, and even in the low five figures, like if you're spending 10 or 20 grand a month, this could be worth testing. And I'm going to pause here to get beat up a little bit because I know that there's, there, it can be porous what I'm saying and there are a bunch of caveats to it. See, I like your strategy, but I understand Will's rationale, but I like your strategy a whole lot more because you di- you're diving into the deep end. You're making that leap. And my sense is, Will, when we start doing YouTube ads for Tier 11, we're probably going <laughs> to gear more towards Gossam's strategy, maybe, maybe with some initial learnings just to sort of find out because obviously we want to get conversions right out of the gate. But it's like I'm really curious to see how it actually works because – I think it takes a little bit more, I don't know if salesmanship is the right word for it, but a little bit more account management to go towards the the custom solution here. Like, hey, we're going to spend a five-figure sum and we're going to go broad. It's kind of like, you know, when we had the conversation about you and smart shopping. It's this, I'm seeing very similar, you know, you're using obviously broad, you're using smart bidding, which I assume is sort of the same thing with, with, with smart shopping. Like you're using yep. that same kind of strategy, go cast that net wide. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to catch a lot of bycatch. You're going to have lots of CPAs that are like completely ugly your first couple of weeks, but you're going to learn a ton. And if you can manage the customer and say, this is, it's going to be ugly the first couple of weeks. However, we're gathering data. Like that's a tougher sell than, you know, or even if I'm a small business owner, I'm like, I don't have 10K to spend per month on YouTube. I want leads now. Like I only want to spend a thousand dollars a month just to sort of see if this thing works. Like there's validity to both arguments here as far as how to start things off. I personally like to go far more aggressive, but I also realize I'm an agency owner and we have, you know, customers that are, you know, we treat their money like, like it's our own. So we understand that. So there's a happy balance, I think, between the two. Well, my method only works with a proven offer. Like if you come to me and you're like, I need to test my offer. I need to test my creative. I need to test my funnel. I need to test my audience. Now we're talking about, all right, let's get a little more granular here so we can put some guardrails on this freaking thing. But if you, if you tell me, you know, I've been in business for three, four years, people buy my stuff. I know exactly what the, the Ascension model looks like. Then we can go broad because now you're only testing one variable. Mm-hmm. So how would that, that, that actually doesn't differ all together from like when Will is going into YouTube, we already have proven options. The only reason we're going into YouTube is mm-hmm. like, Hey, this is working on Facebook. Let's diversify our media spend. Let's see, you know, what we can get on these other channels, you know, interrupted intent versus, you know, pure interruption. And then obviously let's go into Google ads at, at a later date, but it's not all together different. It's not like we're testing brand new stuff. So I wonder if the broad strategy might be a better strategy for maybe the more aggressive customer just to begin with, because it's a proven out offer. Mm. The only thing with that method is like a lot of people who are like purely direct response focused and, and you're going to say, okay, I got, I got 10 grand and we're going to go completely broad for the month. Like I'm very much hands off then, you know, you're putting your faith then in the, 
in the in the Google algorithm, in your video ads and in the offer. And that's kind of all, all you have really. Whereas in the way I do it, I just have a lot more control. And that's kind of what I like. I like to be able to, okay, this placement has spent $400 and it's only got four clicks. I'm turning that placement off. And then I redistribute <laughs> the budget to some of those other placements. And I know it's all, you know, it's super specific. It's super relevant to that business. So that's just the way I have a lot more faith in it have tried the Broadway before as well. And I've seen it go pretty ugly for like some smaller businesses. So well, we have too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've, had to I've had to come to a client and say, Hey, that didn't work. Yeah. And, and you know, generally it, the expectations are managed well on the front end. And it's also, it's not overnight. We actually lost a client very recently. This is maybe uh, Friday, a client canceled on us. And uh, every client we sign, we let them know it takes 90 days to prove concept. You have to be, now we don't make anybody sign contracts. I don't think, you know, but, but I just say handshake 90 days. We need 90 days to make this work. We're 30 days into it and they pulled the plug. And it's because it feels a lot like gambling in the beginning. It's like, I'm just going to keep pouring money into this black box of yours and I'm not seeing any results. And you're telling me that it, at 90 days, we're going to see closer signs of life and, and they just didn't have the threshold for pain for it. Um, and we've had campaigns that start, you know, that in that direction that fail. So there's, it's kind of two edges to that sword for sure. And I can see how well, maybe, maybe your approach is a little more responsible, especially if you're, <laughs> you know, dealing with clients that are already used to a certain, a certain cost per acquisition. Yeah. We have two clients that have major spends that we're using this right now. One spends about a half million a month and they came to us cause they couldn't scale. And so, you know, the, I guess the other thing is we were solving for a different problem. Like we weren't trying mm. to prove YouTube out. They were just saying, Hey, we can't get above this threshold, what can we do? And that's where we, we decided to test the broad strategy. That makes a lot of sense. Like that type of customer, for sure. Like they're mm -hmm. spending what, six figures or whatever it happens to be, or maybe high five figures. And like, oh, we can't get past this sort of threshold. We keep pumping into it. Broad for me, like that would be a logical next step or at least a first step. And that, that was the case in this, in this particular customer. Awesome. Oh, we crushed it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, now it's just a matter of how many more geographies can we open? How much more can we do? But the thing that they have is a proven offer and, and a very a very honed funnel. One thing that frustrates me a little bit, and I know y'all have been here too, is we'll make it rain leads for folks. And then all of a sudden, the leads don't go anywhere past the opt-in because they've never had to, to, to build anything past the opt-in because they've never had advertising that works. And, you know, then they come back and blame the ads and they're like, well, we're not making any money. And I'm like, look, I brought you a qualified prospect who opted in for your thing. It is now your job to take them and nurture them down the sales funnel and actually extract funds from them. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to do this, make sure you know your numbers, you know what a lead is worth, you know how many of the leads actually convert. Uh, because forgive me for saying it this way, and I'm, I'm saying forgive me to our audience, you're playing it at the professional's table now. Right. You know, like we're going to say, hey, YouTube, this is this is a strategy for scale. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying, Google, give me all you got. Mm -hmm. And if you're there, you need to you need to be ready to, you know, to accept and receive and service those leads accordingly. You're at the back rat table now. You're no longer at the one arm bandit. That's right. It's, yeah, there are no do overs or mulligans. You don't. there's no there's no training wheels. It's time to step up <laughs> and sir, insert your marketing analogy there. No, I think uh, it's it's uh, a totally valid point. I mean, I think. You know, when you have an offer that converts, you already know it's converting and it's just a matter of taking that leap of faith. I always think of, you know, the third Indiana Jones movie where he takes the leap of faith. It's kind of like that. It's like you run your camp and like, all right, we're going broad targeting now. You know, we're going to go 10K per month. I'm not going to touch it for two weeks. And it's a leap of faith. If you have a proven offer that's already proven to work on the platform, that's far less of a leap of faith. However, if you have never run any ads on YouTube, or for that matter, you don't even know if people are going to buy your product. Like right. we've had customers come to us and will have had this conversation with plenty of them. Like we have this thing. We want to just launch it on Facebook. All we need is traffic. I'm like, well, you have no idea if anybody likes your stuff, if you have an offer that actually converts. So here's what I'll do is that you're going to sign a 120 day agreement. We're going to spend 30 K per month and you may or may not make money off our fee and 120 K and spend over the next four months. But that's what you need to do in order to prove it out. Or I can give you some tips and you can go to our training and you can learn how to run Facebook ads on your own and do it at $10 a day. Which do you prefer? 
that way you figure out, okay, do I actually have an offer that people want or am I going to go like have an agency professionally test that for me? Like that's a big leap of faith. Like if mm. you're thinking about getting into YouTube and you have never sold to anyone, like you need to find out at a very low level, maybe YouTube isn't the place to start. Maybe you could with some of the strategies that Will's talking about here. A better strategy, in my opinion, would be start with $10 a day on the Facebook platform and see if your offer has a pulse to cold traffic. And I don't care about your custom audiences. I don't care about your website custom audiences. I don't care about your fan base. Who gives a crap about that? Like, does your offer actually have a pulse to people who don't know who you are? And even if you don't get any conversions, look at your data, just like, just like what Will said here. It's like, a lot of this is in the data. Like where, what is resonating? What part are they dropping off? Where, you know, what audiences are working right now? And then that way you've got sort of a foundation for step two, which is, you know, in, in your case, Will, it's now go back and look at the asset and then potentially even scale after you get those initial learnings. But you're doing it to offers that are proven. So, but if you don't have an offer that's proven, Start low-level spend somewhere else, and then come to YouTube after the fact. That would be my, you know, suggestion to anybody who's listening who's saying, "Well, you know, how do, how do I get this YouTube channel to work?" Because the the strategies that we're talking about here have one of the things that we talked about last week and the week, like actually on our YouTube live two weeks ago, was they had an offer that converts, hmm. and that's the key. So. And Cosm, to your point, it's like once you actually get all these leads, and then they're like, "Well," you guys suck because all you're doing is just creating leads for us. We're not making any money off it. Well, that's when you actually need a real sales process and you need, in our case, conversion architecture, stuff that's after the click to monetize those leads, to make sure that you know you can pay more to acquire a customer or whatever it is that you're spending on a lead. It's backing out on, on the back end with, with proven offers that might not be readily apparent on the front end. So Getting back to sort of the sequence here, Will, like you've gone through the initial testing period, um, you know, with the placements. Now you've gone into, you know, affinity audiences in market and custom intent, which we'll leave links in the show notes. so We don't have to go through all those specifically. What's the next phase? Because I think you said that was then. All right, let's test out the front end creative while looking at our data, being very intentional about our data and then creating creatives that maybe uh, can help us to ultimately get to scale, which is phase three. Tell us about that creative phase. Yeah, so yeah, based on the the first kind of 30 day phase is usually the way I break it up in 30 day uh, phases or periods. Um, the first 30 days we've been testing the placements, we've been testing keywords some different audience targeting as well. And based on those, Keywords usually seeing what keywords perform the best, what placements perform the best. We will use that data to then go ahead and create super relevant ad creatives that that actually talk to the specific reason why that person has come to YouTube to answer that specific question, whether it is how to improve shin splints or how to put my baby to sleep or whatever whatever it is, how to how to get better at social media marketing. Um, and then that's what you do. You call that specific keyword out in your first five seconds of the ad, and then you can go into whatever ad format it is that you choose, whether it be a t teach and pitch or pure pitch or something like the educate model, which is kind of one of my favorite ones that I've, that I've taken from Tom Breeze's training. Um, I can get into that a little bit as well if we have time, Ralph. Yeah, why don't you take yeah. us through, I mean, uh, listeners of the show here are certainly familiar with Teach and Pitch, but it definitely bears reiteration of what these kind of models are. I know I've seen some in the discipline space that you've done with calling out specific keywords, at least initially, and then leveraging going right into a Teach and Pitch, but maybe explain each individual type and how it's used. Is it used primarily for cold? Is it used for retargeting as well? But maybe going into each individual ad type would be great. Yeah, so this is definitely primarily cold targeting that I'm talking about here. So the educate model, which I've taken from Tom Breeze. So the A is aim. So you're kind of tapping into the audience's innermost desires. D is for difficulty. So this is the part where you're actually addressing the difficulty that brought the viewer to YouTube. Um, and what's actually interesting about this model as well is you can often move certain elements around. So I often like to put that difficulty part at the start. So the reason why they've come to YouTube, 
how to improve shin splints. So I find like that's a really good one to lead with. And then maybe go into the aim, the innermost desires. Um, use for the understanding. So you kind of show the user that you understand how they're feeling. Uh, see, then you go into some credibility, make sure they know that you're an authority in this space. Um, action plan. So it's good to give them an action plan, like a simple kind of three-step process. This is how we're going to improve your shin, shin splints. You're, you've already taken the first step, which is watching this video. And, you know, you give them kind of a, a, a small tip to get them on the way. Um, teach then, or that's where you go into the, into the, into the tip. Um, you could even put that before the action plan. Again, these are all interchangeable. Um, and then E is exit. So that's where you put your call to action, whatever whatever it may be. So that's the, the educate model. Um, but yeah, again, I like to mix around a lot of those letters um, in that model. But that's definitely kind of one of the my most favored uh, type of, type of a asset to use on YouTube for cold traffic. So have you got an example of one you can think of off the top of your head, which is uh, educate? Because it's it's similar in a lot of ways to teach and pitch, which is um, teach and pitch is basically is three to six seconds to get, this, get them to stop the scroll. And then you teach them something specific. And then it's usually some sort of tip embedded in there. And then it's like, hey, if you like this, then get this kind of thing. We've used that for info. We've used that for digital. We've used that for all kinds of e-commerce products. Educate is a little bit different it's a nice little spin on things and this is one of tom breezes i think gifts us be able to like figure out these acronym models which is <laughs> tremendous but like do you have you got an example of one maybe you know you can think of off the top of your head um yeah it, it is very similar to the teach and pitch as well um it's just yeah it's a little bit more granular where it talks to each of those elements um but i'm trying to think of um one off the top of my head so there was one that we created for for somebody in the beauty space, and it was kind of teaching people how to become a beauty practitioner, like starting a home business or kind of getting to that next level. Um, and a lot of the assets that we actually had for that business were very much focused on the specific beauty technique that the person was learning or how to become whatever it was, either a hairstylist or a nail technician or whatever that beauty technique was. Whereas we use the educate model then to tap into much more of the, the innermost desires almost. It was a, tapping into the business aspect of it and the business opportunity that they can get from this beauty technique, whatever that is, um, whether it's hair or eyelashes. Um, so yeah, we're much more focused on how this can become um, a whole new part of your life, how this can give you a new life. So again, you're talking, you're kind of tapping into the difficulty why they're here. So yeah, you're ultimately here to learn how to do eyelashes or do hair extensions. But then you're kind of talking about how going into the specifics of how that can, um, how that can equal a better life for that person and you're giving them the simple action plan like okay this is the first step you're going to sign up to my free lesson here um click the link below whatever it may be um and then they you know they might go into the teach element of it which is just teaching a little small uh, aspect of whatever the the technique is so i'm hopefully that was clear case, enough i might have <laughs> but it's the technique the underlying aim is even like a business opportunity in this particular case yeah before the ads were more focused on the technique and more focused on that mm -hmm. beauty aspect whereas we use the educate model then to talk more about the business opportunity and how this can be life-changing mm -hmm. and how they can how they can have a much better life by uh by adapting this program and and starting their own business working for themselves getting their own clients uh, creating this business from home so we followed the whole educate model uh using that using that angle or that hook yeah. can i ask a question that might be a bit of a tangent reel me back in if this is too far but, but are, are you building the creative for the clients like you're creating the media we're storyboarding and we're giving them a script wow that's yeah. big yeah and you know i what ralph half of our listeners are agencies right is that fair to say uh yeah I would say so. Something about that? Yep. So from an agency perspective, like we don't create any media for clients. We'll consult loosely, 
But I like to be able to blame the media. I like to be able to say, oh, that video didn't work and I have the data to prove it. What I dislike is is being on the hook for both the campaign performance and the performance of the media. How do you balance that? What do you how do you manage those expectations? Basically, I, I like to have full control. So you've probably gathered that from the placement targeting that I like to do. And then you're they, just a better person than I am. Will. I'm like, <laughs> I want as little responsibility as possible. I'm going to run this broad. I'm going to use your videos. I take zero accountability. And w- yeah, Will's just like grabbing it all with both hands. And he's like, give me the ball, coach. I've yeah. got this. And, and like you usually going from Facebook to YouTube, like we've taken the best assets on Facebook and then we're using the data that we've learned on YouTube and we're basically just improving those assets that we have. Yes, we're, we're, com- we're often creating something completely new, but I'm always pretty confident that it's not going to do worse than the, the video that wasn't specifically designed for these keywords or for these placements. Or, you know, because you've, you've, you have that past data from the past 30 days, you know what's resonating with your audience on YouTube. You've got a pretty good... Ch- you got a pretty good chance of making something better than the one you've just slapped up there and tried. Um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we tend to just as an agency in general, we tend to go deeper. We just really, that's part of our model. It's like we go deeper, you know, into the click itself. Like we talk about like before the click and after the click, but we go in into the click, which is really is at the moment of click, which is, video storyboarding, advising on how to actually create these assets and doing that for Facebook and YouTube. It looks like it's no different. So we do that all the time, but then we obviously take the after the click as well through our conversion architecture division. So I'm not going to turn this into a pitch for tier 11, but I think there's a lot of agencies out there that just stop at the click, which is fine because, you know, it's then the responsibility of the customer. What we found is through uh, Will and I think most of the people here uh, you know, inside the company, we are control freaks and we really do take it personally. And we see an aspect of an ad or an advertising marketing campaign that we can improve on. We jump at it. And that's where like this kind of stuff really comes in. Like that's where the feedback between customer and ad agency really makes a lot of sense. And then the icing on the cake is like, let's improve your overall funnel. Like in this particular case with this, you know, the the beauty model going very vague, like they are an after the click customer as well, which is great because now we have a lot more control. We can really help them get to where they ultimately want to be. But as an agency, that's a conscious decision. Um, we just feel like that's the way that things are heading right now. And, and that's how we've rolled. Uh, as far as the last step go, and I just want to be mindful of our time here is like the last step is once you figure out the creative. Now, the last phase of this is scaling. So you've done your initial sort of audience stuff, a lot of research, go back and we'll leave links in the show notes here, obviously. Then you start working on your creative, the educate model, the teach and pitch model, pure pitch, which is basically just, here's my thing, go get it kind of stuff. Uh, but now it's scaling. Like, how do you take it to that next level with sort of phase three? What's what's your strategy there? That's a, The fun part is the scaling. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we love scaling. <laughs> we love scaling. Um yeah, so when we scale then, so a lot of the time you have those more granular campaigns that have been working well, your placements or your keywords, um, and they are kind of, they're almost propping up your account now. So you have more freedom to try some of the more, the campaigns that you're going to be relying more on the Google algorithm for, like your custom intent or your topic targeting, your your audience targeting, basically. Um, so you just, yeah, you have a lot more wiggle room to test those while your keyword and placement campaigns are doing well. And obviously, when you've started matching your creatives to your keywords, it means they're going to also perform better. So you can turn up your budgets there. You can test new keywords. Um, but to hit that kind of major scale and get to that next phase, you do need to use audience targeting, um, which, yeah, which I only like to do after I've, I've, I've nailed in the, the specific targeting placements and keywords. And audience targeting... Like, give me an example of like in the, we were talking about like the, uh, the shin splints niche or maybe the, the baby, uh, the sleeping niche, like what would be that next phase? Like you get, you know, you get traction on the intent based keywords. Like what would be an example of maybe sort of like that next phase, just to give folks uh, an idea of what you're talking about as far as audience scaling goes. Yeah, so the first one then would, a good place to start would be custom intent. So you take all of your best keywords 
you plug those in and you create a custom intent audience based on those keywords. So Google will go away and it will find audiences, audiences of people who type these keywords into Google or YouTube or are similar to people who type these in. And then you can also find your placements. You can find um, different websites where you've been getting conversions or that are related to the YouTube channels. So then you're like, okay, Google, go away and find people who visit websites like these and then you'll also have a whole bunch of like pre-built ones from uh youtube so there could be ones like sports equipment might be a pre-built one and that's going to like these audiences are huge as well you're you're never really going to max out those pre-built audiences I, I haven't anyway um and then you also have topic targeting so people who who like running that type of thing so you can there's there's a whole bunch of kind of pre-built um, YouTube ones that you can that you can use as well. At that phase, is that where you go back to the custom uh, strategy? Is it like and now? It's like all right, well, let's just test out some broad audiences. I've got some confidence here. I know I'm getting conversions. My CPAs are relatively in line. Is yeah, that where you that, would go, or we that would that, be like the next phase after that? No, that's that's where I'm more comfortable going to that stage when I've gotten the keywords and the placements to work and now i'm starting to use those audiences and basically when you use the audience you have a lot less levers to pull in order to optimize you can you can optimize based on device gender um age and you know there's other things like household income and stuff but i never really like to touch those they're kind of the big ones i like to pull with the audiences but where keyword with keywords and placements i have like so many different levers because i can turn off those individual keywords and individual placements but yeah it's definitely that broader stage i like to go in after i've kind of tested my audiences on the granular granular level and i've tested different uh creatives and i've i've actually crafted some creatives to match that targeting that's been working well and then we go ahead and we kind of we we start scaling then with some of those uh those pre-built audiences from Google and the in-market ones as well are custom intent. So affinity and in-market audiences as well as audience intent, those are all scale audiences from your perspective. Yeah, infinity would be like anybody who has an affinity for running mm -hmm. and then in-market was me a couple of weeks ago. I was Maybe I didn't have an affinity for running because I was quite new to it, but I was in the market for running products. Um, so they are, yeah, all different types of audience targeting that you can try as well. And how's the shin splints doing these days? They're actually really good at the minute. Yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, working on my load <laughs> management now. I'm back running, so I'm probably going to go out and do like a 4K after this. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> It'd be funny if after all that, you stopped running. And I'm like, you used that whole analogy, and now you just threw in the top. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I quit. I gave up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, you know, next week a 4K, next week the Dublin Marathon. Uh, yeah maybe marathon? hopefully there probably is. oh there is yeah there yeah is. there is but no i'm I'm definitely a, a little while off the marathon level <laughs> yeah no kidding it's slow Good and steady there that's yeah absolutely wins the race yeah. as per usual yeah. so will this has been awesome man I, there's uh so much here i think the audience can really latch on to if you're new to youtube ads or if you're looking at it in a different way you've got some scale right now i think there's a little something here for everyone in this week's show. And it's been uh, tremendous to see you, uh, you know, scale and grow that aspect of the tier 11 business. And obviously with your development coming from, you know, the Facebook side and, and diving in head long into YouTube and working with all the other Google guys within the agency, it's been tremendous to see that development and, you know, so appreciate all your efforts on that side. Um, and I think the listeners here have uh, certainly benefited from a lot of your wisdom, even if you and Cosm don't necessarily agree, but that's okay. That's what we <laughs> like here. We like a little conflict. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Will, the Irish Breeze, Palmer, thank you so much for coming on PT this week, pal. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Ralph. It's been a pleasure. For uh, my awesome co-host, Cosm, it's been a pleasure uh, serving you here at Perpetual Traffic Radio. Until next week, y'all, see ya. Peace.